It's knowing that your door is always open and your path is free to walk. It makes me tend to leave my sleeping bag rolled up and stashed behind your couch. It's knowing I'm not shackled by forgotten words and bonds and the ink stains that have dried upon some line. It keeps you in the back rows by the rivers of my memory. It keeps you ever gentle on my mind. It's not clinging to the rocks and ivy painted on their columns now that bind me. Or something that somebody said because they thought we fit together walking. It's not knowing that the world will not be cursing or forgiving when I walk around the railroad track and find. That you're moving on the back roads by the rivers of my memory And I wish you're just gentle on my mind Though the wheat fields and the clotheslines and the junkyards and the highways come between us And some other woman's crying to her mother cause she turned and I was gone I still might run in silence, tears of joy might stain my face, and the summer sun might burn me till I'm blind. But not to where I cannot see you walking on the back roads by the rivers flowing gentle on my mind. I dip my cup of soup back from a gurgling, crackling cauldron in some train yard. My beard a rustling towel and a dirty ad pulled bow across my face. Through cup hands round the tin can, I pretend to hold you to my breast and find that you're waiting from the back roads by the rivers of my memories, ever smiling, ever gentle on my mind. with you back on another Mac Files News Network broadcast. We're grateful to have you tonight and uh, we have got a treat for you tonight in store and no, I'm not going to sit here and run my mouth for three hours like I did Tuesday night. <laughs> That's not the treat. <laughs> oh, that is not the treat. No, we're going to have Mr. Bill Federer here in just about three minutes and uh, it's a pre-recorded interview. And it's going to educate us. Part one tonight, actually, we're going to be recording part two um, sometime this coming week, actually, this next week. And um, so I want you to sit back. I want you to relax and enjoy this man of uh, faith and this uh, historical genius. He's, he's a great guy. And uh, we appreciate Bill and looking forward to him uh, giving me some insight tonight on a uh, interesting facet of society right now, and it is the rise of Islam. Islam um, covers almost a third of the entire earth. It's the fastest growing religion out there. And um, 
I will say more about this probably on part two than I will tonight. But um, there's just a lot of things about Islam that you can't escape about its core system of beliefs. And we don't hate Muslims. We don't hate any group of people. We pray like we pray for all people to find Christ and to know the path of truth. Um, I think one of the biggest lies, though, that we are told out there in the society that there are that Islam is a moderate religion. It's not a religion of hate. And while not every Muslim that is out there tonight hates, the religion itself teaches that. And there's no escape in that. Um, this idea that Islam and Israel can coexist, I think, was shattered on October the 7th when the events of what happened with Hamas took place. And this history of the Middle East, folks, is very key to understand the future. Because uh, the future of planet Earth is going to be soaked with blood. And I'm not 100% certain to be frank with you, that Islam is not going to play a huge role in that. Um, there's every indication that Islam's not going away. And if you look at a map, and you look at, uh, we used to call it the 1040 window. And I don't even know what they call it today, but the world's greatest persecution of Christians and believers, other than the Chinese, comes from Islam. It is the second leading persecutor of Christians, and you may argue it that it's the first. So I'm going to let Bill explain a little bit about the history of this religion. I'll be back at the end for a few final thoughts, and we hope that you'll enjoy this tonight. I'm just grateful you're with us on this Thursday night. Sit back, enjoy. You're going to enjoy this. It's it's good stuff. It's never, never a bad show with Bill Federer, and I'm excited to sit here and listen to it with you tonight as well. And we'll be back after this. To say goodnight to you. We're so grateful you're here on a Thursday night. And um, enjoy Bill Federer and the history and the face of Islam part one. And uh, we'll see you after this interview with him. Be blessed tonight. And a good evening, everybody. Chris McDonald with a very special Mac File News Network pre-recorded interview. My dear friend, Bill Federer. He's a dear, dear buddy. American Minute. Uh, dot org, I think is his website. He's got a book, America, God and Country, and uh, other websites. I'll let him do that. Chris's memory is awful. I should have a little note card with these things, but I know I was close. But he does put out a, a, a email uh, daily, American Minutes. Great stuff, good historical thing. He's always been a, a great uh, friend to come on the show anytime and talk with us. We're going to be talking about a very serious situation. We're going to be dealing with Islam today, history of Islam, Israel, the hatred and the ancient hatred of Ezekiel 35. Bill, it's good to see you, my friend. And I want to tell you, it's been a blessing the last couple of years to have you on our network. Uh, you've never disappointed. And uh, I just I appreciate what you do. Uh, I've seen you in person and uh, the energy and the anointing and just the common sense approach to uh, the world and the church is very appreciated by this host. And I want to tell you, we're grateful that you're a friend and we're grateful that you're part of this network. We're good to have you today, always. Oh, hey, Chris. Great to be with you. Bill, we want to talk about, uh, you know, I, I feel like that uh, I, when we talk about what we're going to do today, you know, the world, there's been some dates in history that have just changed the world. 9-11 being, I would say, one of them. Pearl Harbor, another one. Um, pretty much some other dates we could name. But, you know, October the 7th of 2023, I think, is going to go down as another bookmark in the in the change of this world system because of what happened to Israel uh, by Hamas. And now we see the United States slowly being dragged into a, this conflict in the Middle East. And um, Islam has always been very stealth at hiding its true colors until it strikes and until it does something like it did um, in October. And I'll make no mistake about it, Hamas their attack on Israel was basically an arm of Islam and this, this this jihadism that is across the globe. And you've done a beautiful presentation. I'm going to let you go ahead and share our screen, and uh, I'm going to let you take over. But uh, the world's become a very dangerous place. It's not that it's not been a dangerous place, but I just think that these events, that they, they keep getting more intense, 
more very troublesome and it just seems like we're being sucked into this and uh eventually i don't see how i don't touch america again in a real way yeah well i totally agree with you and i think it's been on purpose um but i do have um a uh, presentation where i go through the history of islam uh by the way my website's americanminute.com oh, in case gotcha. anyone's interested um but uh you know here we have uh a news a news article uh this was just a month after the event uh, on october 7th but um we're obviously several months past this but uh 1400 massacred and um now apologists for islam tell us that those killers didn't represent true islam yet a lot of the killers yell Allahu akbar and they claim they do represent true islam and so the question is who can tell us what true islam is and really only one person, and uh, and that's uh, Muhammad. And so uh, Muhammad was the best Muslim that ever lived, and his life is called the Sunnah, which means the way or the example. And his life went through three stages, and we have to understand these three stages to understand those that are trying to be like him. First stage, he was a religious leader, then he became a military leader, and then he became a, polit a, mil a political and then a military leader. So the world, uh, back in the Europe and Asia and the Middle East, you had the Roman Empire from 527 um, AD, or uh, BC, 527 BC, um, and then in 313 AD, Constantine um, legalized Christianity. And so they, it became a Christian Roman Empire. And then it was being attacked from the east by the Persians. And uh, they were called the Sassanid, Sassanid Persians. And it was like the east versus the west, right? During the Cold War, you had the, you know, the American West and the Russian East. Well, back then it was the Byzantine Roman Christian West and the Sassanid Persian East. And they beat each other up and they left a power vacuum. And into that power vacuum came Islam. So Muhammad was born around 570 AD. And his um, uh, father dies before he's born. His mother dies when he's six years old. His grandfather and guardian dies when he's eight years old. And then he's orphaned and taken in by an uncle, Abu Talib, who's a merchant that goes on camel rides. And so Muhammad would travel with his uncle and go to different cities and hear about different religions. And uh, there were pagan and Zoroastrian and Jewish and Christian and Manichaeism. And when he's 25 years old, he's working for a wealthy widow named Khadija. And she's 40 years old. She's widowed twice. And she decides to marry Muhammad. She's 40. He's 25. Now he has time. And he goes out to caves and prays, which is what the Christian desert fathers were doing. A movement swept through Christianity called pietism that says if you're really a Christian, you should withdraw from society and just focus on your own personal relationship with God. And so these guys would withdraw and, and live in caves like hermits and build platforms in the desert and bake in the sun, thinking they were denying their flesh and getting holier. But it was this me-focused attention on spirituality and not involved in trying to protect their uh, country. Anyway, uh, this movement swept through Christianity and Muhammad, when he's 25 years old, he decides he's going to do the same thing. So he goes out into a cave and prays and a spirit appears to him and squeezes him and commands him to read. He said, I cannot read, squeezes him a second time, said, read. He said, I cannot read. Happens a third time and the spirit sits on him and he begins to recite. And that's how the Quran came to Muhammad. He would get these verses, he would repeat them till he had to memorize, and then he would teach them to his followers. The word Quran means recitation. It's an oral thing. And because Muhammad and his original followers were illiterate, uh, Muhammad could not read. So Muhammad goes back to his wife. He tells her he thinks he's demon possessed. And she decides to test the spirit by taking off some of her robes and veils and says, and asks, can you still see the spirit? And he said, yes, over there. And uh, she pulls off some more veils. Can you still see the spirit? Yes, over there. And finally, she puts his head under her shift, whatever that is, 
and uh, says, can you still see the spirit? And he goes, no. And she said, well, it must have been from a God because it was embarrassed to look upon me without all my veils on. Wow. That was the test to decide whether or not the spirit appearing to Muhammad was from God or not, was the wife uh, removing her different veils. And so, um, of course, the Bible says the way you test a spirit is that every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus is the Christ is from Antichrist. Absolutely. <laughs> And uh, But Muhammad couldn't read the New Testament. He didn't know that. Anyway, so uh, his wife suggests that Muhammad visit with a cousin who was a Ebionite Christian heretical priest. And the Ebionites were this uh, heretical group that believed that Jesus was a created being. And this cousin tells Muhammad that maybe the spirit appearing to him was the one that appeared to Moses. And then that cousin dies, and then Muhammad's left with this spirit. And so he uh, gets these verses. And so it's interesting, when you look at the belief systems that existed pre-Muhammad, and then you look at the beliefs that went into Muhammad's religion, you can see a lot of similarities. So in Arabia, the pagans worshiped 360 different gods and the most popular one was Hubal, the moon god. And their calendar began with the first sight of the crescent moon over the desert. And so this was incorporated into Islam. And they had a rock they thought had fallen from the moon. It's a glass impact rock where a meteor hit the hot desert sands. And they these pagans, pre-Muhammad, would kiss this rock, walk around this rock, bottle this rock five times a day. Muhammad kissed this rock. It got incorporated into Islam. And the rock, along with the other 360 different gods, were in this square building called the Kaaba. And the pagans would walk around it and bow to it and so forth. And, uh, and again, they did this for centuries pre-Muhammad. And then there are the Sabaeans. Now, it's interesting. Uh, Yemen today is in the news. Yes. Yemen used to be Sheba or Seba. And that was one of the sons of Abraham by Keturah. So we all know Abraham and Sarah had Isaac, and then Abraham and Hagar had Ishmael. Well, after Hagar and Ishmael are, are, are sent away, and after Sarah dies, uh, Abraham married Keturah and had a number of sons, Midian, and one of them was Sheba. And Sheba immigrated into Arabia and to the furthest south and west part of Arabia, and it's called Sheba. And uh, and so it's just 14 miles across the uh, the strait from uh, the Horn of Africa, where is Ethiopia. And so uh, in Yemen, in Sheba, uh, you had these um, people with a Hebrew heritage, and um, and then around a uh, hundred years before Muhammad, the uh, king of Sheba. Uh, of course, during Solomon's time, you have the Queen of Sheba. But um, during um, uh, about a century before Muhammad, there was a king of Sheba that basically converted to uh, Judaism. And so for 150 years, Yemen was a Jewish kingdom. Wow. And, um, and so during this time is when Islam started. And so, uh, so there were some of the beliefs of the Sabaeans and the Jews that got incorporated into Islam. And so one of them was that they would go on this Hajj pilgrimage to the Kaaba and they'd walk around, they had ritual washing, they had throwing rocks, you know, right? They're like throwing rocks at Satan. They stoned adulterers and they cut off hands of thieves. And anyway, uh, and then there's the Zoroastrian religion and that was in Persia. And the Zoroastrians believed that paradise was filled full of virgins that would fulfill all the guy's desires. And so that got incorporated into Muhammad's belief system. The Zoroastrians also believed in jinns or genies. And that got incorporated like a, a Aladdin's lamp, a thousand and one Arabian nights. And, and then Manichaeism. So about a century before Muhammad, there was this guy named Mani, and he combined pieces of different religions into one. Now, from his point of view, he was extracting the truth out of these different ones, but it was this 
uh, idea that could have impacted Muhammad and this idea of having beliefs in Islam, portions of which were reflected in some of these other faiths. And, um, and then you have uh, the Jews. And so Muhammad could not read, so he could never read the Old Testament. But he heard their oral stories, their Talmud, their Mishnah. And some of these stories got reflected in Islam. Mm -hmm. And um, so the Christians and Jews were unique. They could read. They were called people of the book. And, uh, and so somebody might say, well, how could Muhammad and his followers memorize all these Quran verses if they were illiterate? Well, in Arabic, they had a rhyme to them, very similar to rap music today. So maybe there's somebody in school and they can't read, but they memorize these long rap songs and they can memorize them because there's a beat, there's a rhythm. Thomas Carlyle wrote in On Heroes and Hero Worship, 1840, he says, Arab Seymour method in the we much, much, of it, much of it is rhythmic, a kind of wild chanting. And then there's the, the Christian faith. And Muhammad could not read the Old Testament. Uh, he thought the Trinity was the Father, Mary, and Jesus. Um, and even Encyclopedia Britannica stated of Muhammad, the gospel was made known to him chiefly through apocryphal and heretical sources. And so he had a version of Christianity, but it was apocryphal and heretical. I could get into it. One was uh, an infancy gospel of Thomas written several centuries after Jesus by someone who knew nothing of Jewish life. There's obvious inconsistencies and errors of things that did not exist in Israel that got incorporated into this infancy gospel. So nobody is taking it serious, and that's why it is not in our Bible. But it had things like Jesus making clay birds and clapping, and they flew away. And uh, Jesus playing with a playmate on the roof of a house, and the playmate fell down and died, and Jesus raised him from the dead so they could play some more. I mean, fanciful little stories. Well, guess what stories got reflected in Islam? those stories, and the, but the Muslims take them as fact. Yet we know that only one source of those stories, this infancy gospel, that nobody takes as serious. Anyway, so Muhammad, he has his faith, and he's really excited about it. He feels like there's something in it for everyone. And so he goes into Mecca, and he, uh, instead of everybody joining it, uh, they're not excited about it. And so he begins to get confrontational. So in 12 years, he only makes 70 converts. And the people of Mecca with their 360 different gods, they're all getting along. But now Muhammad is getting exclusive. He's saying that it's just his way. And the people of Mecca consider him a disturber of the peace. They chase him out of town. First in the year 619 AD, his year of sorrows because his wife Khadija dies. And he tries going to a city called Al-Taif. They don't want him. They pelt him with rocks and stones. And so finally in 622 AD, he goes to the Jewish city of Medina. And they're nice. They let Muhammad in as a Muslim immigrant. In fact, the first ever Muslim immigrant. And Muhammad tries to present his face to the Jews, but they reject him. And so Muhammad changes the direction of bowing from Jerusalem to Mecca. And, um, and then he goes into the minority neighborhoods and he begins to organize a following. We're familiar with the term of organizing in the community. Well, when his following gets big enough, he goes to the Jews and pressures them to accommodate him and his followers politically. They do. And now Muhammad is a political leader in addition to being a religious leader. And then uh, his followers in Mecca get confrontational. And he has them chased out. Of, uh, he sees that, that they were chased out of town. And so now you have a lot of Muslim immigrants and they show up at Medina and the Jews let him in. And Muhammad then allows his followers to rob the caravans headed back to Mecca in retaliation for the Meccans chasing them out of town. So where Jesus said, if they take your coat, give them your shirt. Muhammad's attitude was, if they take your house, you retaliate and you attack their caravans. And so he participates uh, in uh, these attacks. Um, one is the uh, Battle of uh, Badra in 624 AD, 
And um, with 300 warriors, Muhammad defeats a thousand. And this victory convinced him that he's supposed to be a military leader. He fights in 66 battles and raids in the next eight years before he dies. Uh, the Battle of Badra, which I just mentioned, the Battle of Ahud, and expulsion of ben Banu Nadir. So Banu means clan, and uh, the N Nadir were one of the three Jewish tribes in Medina that let Muhammad in. But these three Jewish tribes didn't get along with each other. And so he gets offended at the smallest of the tribes, confiscates their property, chases them out of town. And then 626 AD, he gets offended at the second largest tribe, a clan of Jews, confiscates their property, chases them out of town. Uh, and then the Meccans got tired of their caravans being robbed, and they send uh, soldiers to protect their caravan. And Muhammad dig digs trenches all around the city of Medina, which renders the cavalry of the Meccans useless. You can't charge your horse and camel across a field full of potholes. And um, so then uh, he goes to some of these Meccans at night and he bribes them. They slip away. Goes to some of the other ones at night and threatens them and they slip away. Sort of the bribe or the bullet. Uh, the Chicago politics type thing. And then it gets freezing cold for a week and the rest of the Meccans lose heart and retreat. And Muhammad considers this a great victory. He goes back into the city of Medina and the last Jewish tribe, the Banu Quareza, uh, he's taking a bath and a spirit appears to him and says, how can you rest when all his enemies are in your midst? He said, where? And it points toward the Jewish neighborhood. So he bottles them in their neighborhood for 25 days. When they finally surrender, he brings them out to the market and chops their heads off of the men, sells the women and children into slavery. So within five years, from 622 AD to 627 AD, within five years of Muhammad coming into the Jewish city of Medina, there's not a Jew left in the city of Medina. They were chased out, killed, or enslaved. And so this set a pattern of immigrate, increase, and eliminate. Immigrate into a host country as a religious refugee, increase the number of your followers amongst minorities and begin to get politically demanding. And then military, you have random outbreaks of violence in the communities and uh, the inhabitants no longer feel safe and move out and they take over the community. One quick interjection before you keep going. Is that not what the Palestinians have done? in reality, in, re in real time? Yes, and it's, it, it's happened in Europe. I mean, there's whole neighborhoods in Germany, all around Paris, France, um, you know, in Lebanon, um, you know, Syria. They, they would first come in uh, as refugees and take advantage. Uh, Kosovo, I mean, Serbia had been a Christian country for a millennium, and they were fighting uh, Muslim invasions. Uh, but then they were nice and they let in uh, some Muslim refugees and they settled in the inner city of Kosovo. Then they took over more of the city, more of the city, more of the city until they took over the whole city. And Bill Clinton recognized Kosovo as a brand new country. And the, the Serbians are like, what happened? What happened to our, our city? And um, and so this pattern, uh, it's it's very much like... Um, I uh, hate to use the analogy, very parasitic, right? Yes. Comes in and lives off Absolutely. the host victim until it gets big enough to kill the host victim. And um, But it's an ideology. So then you have 628, the Battle of Kaibar, and the chief refused to tell Muhammad where the treasure was hidden. And Muhammad had the chief stretched out on the ground and they kindled the fire on his chest. He still wouldn't tell, so they beheaded him. And then 629, 80, the Battle of Muta. And then at 6.30, he finally conquers Mecca and pulls out a list of people to kill. And 10 names are on this list. One of them was a man who had made up poems, making fun of Muhammad. He had two slave girls that recited the poems. Muhammad was insulted by the poems, and so he orders them murdered. So the thought of if you insult the prophet, you get murdered, goes all the way back to the prophet himself. And, uh, and then the Battle of Hunan, Battle of Aryaz, the Siege of Al-Taif, and so Muhammad was using catapults, hurling these huge rocks into Al-Taif. And some messengers tell Muhammad that those rocks are killing innocent women and children. And his response was, they are among them. Yeah. So they got to be killed too. So it's okay to kill innocent women and children to advance Islam because Muhammad did. And then the 631 AD, the Battle of Tabuk, subjugation of Banu Taqif, that's Yemen. And um, and then the subjugation of the Ghassanids. 
So uh, when the Jews had taken over parts of Yemen, uh, where that chieftain converted to, to Judaism, uh, there were Christians that fled. These were Arab Christians, and they fled to sort of a buffer area between uh, where Israel used to be, because this is in the 600s. Right. Um, and uh, and so and these Ghassanids, these Arab Christians, had been there for two centuries. It was a thriving community until Muhammad and his men conquered them. And then Muhammad dies in 632 AD. And um, now one of the motivations for the Muslim warriors was they got to get booty. And so um, one of the Hadith says when the messenger of Allah sent out a raiding party, he would say to them, make your raids in the name of Allah, in the way of Allah, fight those whoever denies Allah, do not steal from the booty. And then another verse in the Hadith, uh, he said, the person who participates in holy battles in Allah's cause will be recompensed by Allah either by a reward or booty if he survives or will be admitted to paradise if he is killed. And so what do you get in paradise? But 72 virgins, there's a sexual motivation uh, to die um, in jihad because you can uh, have this um, sexual fulfillment. And, and then uh, another verse says, Prophet, we have made lawful to you the slave girls who Allah has given you as booty. And um, and then Surah 8 says, Whatever you take as spoils of war, lo, a fifth thereof is for Allah and for the messenger. So Muhammad got a fifth of the booty from robbing these caravans. And uh, so in Islam, you can get four wives plus as many extra women as your right hand possesses, as many as you take in battle. And if you want to get rid of one of your wives, you just say, I divorce you three times and she's gone out the door. Can't even go back in and get her clothes. She's gone. And then you can just replace her. And um, and so there's this aspect of Islam that's threefold religious, political, military. Right. So in your car, you have uh, RPMs, revolutions yeah. per minute. <laughs> but you can remember, so there's freedom. <laughs> there's freedom for all religions in America, but Islam is not just a religion because Muhammad was not just a religious leader. He was also a political leader and also a military leader. And um, anyway, um, is this interesting? I know there's a, a lot there, but um, feel free to... Go back, go back to the victimhood thing. I want you to read that uh, that slide right before Sigmund Freud because I found this incredible because that's what we're hearing today uh, in the the world of the the media that how Israel is all the apartheid and these victims, these Muslims, Palestinians, Arabs, whatever that they are, and this it is sort of rooted in this attitude where he claimed they were victims of Mecca's intolerance and they justified in retaliating. And again, that spirit, uh, Bill, is alive and well today, but I'm glad people are seeing this because it's rooted in Muhammad's theology, Muhammad's thing. And it, again, it's con it, it, it's contrasted with Christ, who did not retaliate when he suffered injustice. And if you retaliated, you would not be forgiven. So is this a spirit that is still rampant in um Islam today? Because it seems like that's what we're hearing, that the victims are not the perpetrators of evil but they're justified in what they do and do an evil because they're victims. Right. So you wonder, um, and if you read the Islamic history, they'll say that all their battles were defensive. It's like, right. how can you be outside of Paris a hundred years after Muhammad's death and call it defensive? It's like you're, you're an entire continent away. Right? And so they feel if they're, if they feel threatened by you, then they're justified in attacking you. And so, um, but the idea of retaliating goes back to honor. So where Jesus said, if you uh, if you forgive your enemy seven times seven, and if you don't forgive, you're not going to be forgiven. Um, that concept does not exist in Islam. You only forgive your enemy after you have conquered them. Once you've conquered them, then if you want to show mercy, you can. But there's none. There's no forgiving your enemy before you conquer them. And um so the idea of honor. Um, so Muhammad dies in 632 AD. And then following him is a general, Abu Bakr, who's the father of Aisha, the six-year-old that Muhammad married, consummated at nine years old. Um, but Abu Bakr fought in every battle with Muhammad. 
And he said, I know the way. And so that the way word for the way is Sunnah. And so they call themselves Sunni. So 90% of Muslims are Sunni. And they go back to Abu Bakr, who was the one of the father-in-laws of Muhammad because he had many wives. So this was one of the father-in-laws. And, uh, uh, and then after Abu Bakr, you had uh, uh, another caliph, uh, Umar. And uh, so Abu Bakr was murdered, and then Caliph Umar was murdered, and Caliph Uthman was murdered, and the Caliph Muayyah was murdered. And, um, uh, and then finally you get Ali. And Ali was married to Muhammad's daughter, Fatima. And the followers of Ali are called Shiali or Shiite. Right. About 10% right. of Muslims are Shiite, mostly in Iran. Right. And so the fighting between the Sunni and the Shiite is the fighting between the followers of the father-in-law versus the followers of the son-in-law. And, um, uh, and so Ali did not sufficiently retaliate and kill the murderers of the previous um, caliph. And so Muaya wanted to, uh, for the sake of the honor of the previous caliph, he had to fight the battle against Ali. And so his men put Quran verses on pieces of paper on the tips of their spears, and Ali's soldiers didn't want to hit the Quran verses, and so they surrendered, so they kill Ali. Um, but, um, but this idea that you didn't revenge enough if you don't revenge enough, then they'll revenge against you for not revenging. In a, a, so the concept of forgiveness uh, doesn't exist um, un unless you've conquered your enemy. And then if you want to show mercy, you can. Um, but Jesus said you forgive your enemies. You turn the other cheek. You walk the extra mile. If they take your your you know coat, give them your shirt. And, and it's um, uh, a difference there. So, um, but they want to claim victimhood. So, so um, they, they uh, even um, this projection. So if a Muslim man rapes a woman, it's the woman's fault because mm -hmm. she evidently looked pretty and tempted the man and allowed herself to be used as a tool of Satan to tempt the man. So the woman gets punished. And so in America, we punish the rapists in Islam, they punish the woman that has been raped. And so um, so the concept of psychological projection is that where they, the attacker blames the victim. So they blame you for what they're guilty of. And if they're attacking you, it's your fault. <laughs> and uh, so um, anyway, um, Supreme Court Justice Robert Jackson wrote in Law in the Middle East, 1955, Islamic law offers the American lawyer a study in dramatic contrasts. Its striking feature relative to our law is not likenesses, but inconsistencies, not similarities, but contrarieties. The law of the Middle East is the antithesis of Western law. So um, there's two sets of verses in the Quran based on the two cities Muhammad lived in, Mecca and Medina. The verses he gets in Mecca are a little more peaceful. They're more religious. The verses he gets in Medina are political and militant. Right. And the later verses supersede the earlier verses. Let me uh, ask you a question right there, because uh, one of the things that you hear in the media all the time, and you hear it in church circles as well, that Islam is a peaceful religion. And I read a book many years ago by Mark Gabriel, and he brought this out that what happens is that the media to justify Islam and its actions and to protect Islam, they always highlight the religious and peaceful verses of Muhammad that, as you said, he wrote in Mecca. And they totally ignore the calls for the beheading of Jews and the slaughter of Christians and anybody that doesn't submit, they're going to cut their heads off, which is more the political and military verses. Is this where this attitude comes from? Because most people don't realize there was two... There was two locations, and he was peaceful and rather religious in Mecca, but he sure wasn't that in Medina, was he? Right. So by way of comparison, in the Bible, there is an Old Testament and a New Testament. Right. The Old Testament has some violence in it. Moses and Joshua wiping out tribes. New Testament, Jesus and the apostles did not kill anybody. And what do we say? The later verses are the ones we are going to try to imitate. 
Same way in Islam, only in reverse. In reverse. That's their peaceful point. verses came first, and they're, when he got those in Mecca, and then they're abrogated or superseded by the Medina verses that are more political and militant. And so the last example Muhammad left was a political and military example. So um, anyway, so uh, within five years of Muhammad's death, every pre-existing culture in Arabia is eliminated. And uh, the three steps are like Caesar's three steps. Vini, vidi, vici, I came, I saw, I conquered. Muhammad's was immigrate, increase, eliminate. Immigrate, immigrate as a religious refugee increase and become politically involved and then finally eliminate the previous culture by becoming militant uh this was a fox article the uh, muslims gained control of the city council in uh, ham tramick michigan right first member of u.s majority muslim city council warns today we show the polish right so they're gonna retaliate back mm -hmm. and um so there's a 1400 year track record of political and military Islamic expansion. It comes in three waves an Arab Persian wave, a Turkish wave, and then finally in 1928, the last wave. And um, if you want, I can go through these. Yeah, real quick, go ahead. Cause we got about 10 minutes. I know you got to go. And I just wanted to, to cover, cause I want to bring us into this modern time, how these roots you're witnessing what happens. Cause it's just rooted uh, Bill, and what's going on with the Middle East. And this is good information because I don't think a lot of people understand the roots of the things they're here in, in modern media circles and sadly some church circles as well. And they don't realize that this ancient hatred goes back, this, this Islamic to immigrate, increase and eliminate its own going right now. This is the Islamic playbook and it, it is rooted in the past, but it's going on now. So I'm going to let you go ahead and take it from here and you can deal with these three springs and and we'll get to the modern thing. We'll wrap this up. Yeah, yeah. Well, and if I don't get through it all, I'm happy to come back and finish Yeah, we'll it. have part two. Absolutely, buddy. Absolutely. Um, so the goal of fundamental Islam is to set up a one world government called a caliphate. And the, the leader is called the caliph. And an invention that was at this time was called the stirrup for riding horses. So Romans and Greeks, they would sit on a horse and sort of balance, and they did invent a saddle, which was a big deal. Prior to the saddle, you had to just sort of completely balance, but then the saddle was strapped on, and you could sort of hold on to the saddle. Um, and then it was the Mongols that invented the stirrup. At first, it was just a rope tied around a horse with two loops at the ends that you would stick your big toes in, and it would help you to keep balance on the horse. And then that made its way across the Gobi Desert, the China Silk Road to Persia. And they made them out of metal with leather straps. And this allowed you more control in the saddle. So you could actually put your feet on the stirrups, stand up while you're galloping, and put the full power of the horse behind a scimitar sword. So the Europeans used heavy metal swords that were forged and at this time, it was Damascus steel, where they would hammer it down on itself and then put it back in the forge and heat it up and then hammer it back down on itself. And they would just keep folding over, hammering it down, and it would get thinner and thinner and stronger and stronger. And uh, so these scimitar swords were light as a razor blade, and they could hold the reins of the horse in one hand, the scimitar sword in the other, and at a full gallop, they literally could slice them one in half. And you cannot outrun a horse. So it's the fastest thing on the battlefield. Here's the U.S. Supreme Court chamber in Washington, D.C. And it has Muhammad with his Quran and his scimitar sword. Wow. And this is Muhammad's sword. It's in a museum called the Topkapa Palace in Istanbul, Turkey. Matter of fact, it has a whole room full of swords from all the different caliphs. And um, one of Muhammad's generals was... Khalid Ibn al-Walid, and he was nicknamed the Drawn Sword of Allah because he was undefeated in 100 battles. And um, and then Ali was given a sword called the Zulfikar and it had two points on the end. And, and so within 23 years of Muhammad's death, the Muslims went from Mecca, they conquered Yemen, uh, they conquered into the Middle East, they conquered Persia, 
Syria. Now, Syria used to be Christian uh, from the time it was evangelized by the Apostle Paul. Uh, Jerusalem had been Christian for three centuries since Constantine. Egypt was completely Christian, evangelized by Mark that wrote the gospel, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Uh, Turkey was Christian, right? All seven churches mentioned in the book of Revelation were in Turkey. And then all of North Africa was Christian. So 250 Catholic dioceses along North Africa. St. Augustine of Pippo was from Carthage. Today, that's Tunisia. And in the year 711, um, you had uh, 80,000 Muslims invade Spain. Now, when they conquered North Africa and the Middle East quickly, it cut off trade to Europe. And one of the things that were traded was papyrus. These were reeds that grew along the Nile Delta that they would put in water and soak and, and line them up together and it would turn into paper. And uh, so when the Muslims conquered and cut off trade across the Mediterranean, there was a paper shortage in Europe. And for the next couple of centuries, they wrote fewer books. And so this period of time is called the Dark Ages. And then they went to Alexandria, Egypt, where the largest and oldest library in the world was. And they asked uh, Khalif Umar what to do with all these books. And the answer reportedly was, every book that does not agree with the Quran, burn. And every book that does agree with the Quran is redundant because we have the Quran. So burn them all. So it took six months to burn all these ancient books. And, um, and so in the year 711, you had a Muslim leader named Tariq. And he crossed into across the Strait of Gibraltar and, and there was a big mountain there and uh, we call it the rock of Gibraltar um, but the Arabic word for rock or mountain is Jabal and his commander's name was Tariq so they named it Jabal Tariq or Jabal Gibraltar so Gibraltar is Jabal Tariq the mountain of Tariq he invades Spain in the year 711 with 80,000 men and Spain was a bunch of kingdoms that never got along until so they picked off one after another after another. In 10 years, they conquered all of Spain, crossed the Pyrenees Mountains, conquered southern France, and with their Arabian horses and scimitar swords, and the Europeans were still fighting on foot, uh, they were uh, made it all the way to Paris. And um, so the Battle of Tours, 732 AD, you had... Uh, Charles Martel, the grandfather of Charlemagne. And rather than stand in a field waiting to be sliced up, he put his men on top of a hill. And um, the Muslims charged up the hill, but he put his men in a, in a block formation. And um, the horses didn't want to ride into the, the block. And, and while the battle's going on, Charles Martel sent men into the Muslim camp to free the booty. Mm -hmm. And the Muslim warriors saw their booty being let go, and they left the fight. And the commander, Abdul Rahman, tries to rally his men back. He gets distracted and killed. And the Muslims can't decide who their next commander is going to be. And so they pick up and go back to Spain. And so that's the Battle of Tours, 732 AD. And um, so Charles um, Martel uh, teaches his men how to fight on horseback and make a stir up. And five years later, they start winning battles. It takes 700 years of battles to drive the Muslims out of Spain. And then you have, uh, they attack Constantinople, which was the capital of Europe at the time. And, um, but the Greeks had Greek fire where oil and sawdust, sort of a napalm gel, jelly mix of fire. And they'd spray it out of these hot oil cannons and, um, and stop the Muslims. And so, uh, that was the beginning of the concept of later. So they want to conquer the world, but it may just have to wait till later. And so that's an important thing. So the word Islam means submission to the will of Allah. A Muslim is one who has submitted, and they think there'll be world peace when the whole world submits. Right. So to the fundamental Muslim, world peace means world Islam. So it's, Lincoln said, during the Civil War, we all declare for liberty, but in using the same word, we do not all mean the same thing. That's right. So we all want peace. But when we say peace, it's not the same as when they say peace. <laughs> and, um, right. So the world's divided into two in their mindset, the House of Islam and the House of War, the Dar al-Islam and the Dar al-Harb. 
So the world is divided between the half that has submitted and the half that's in war because it's in the process of being submitted, subdued. And so a moderate Muslim thinks the world's going to submit to Allah later. Maybe at the end of the world, maybe it's figurative, but it's so far off in the future, they really don't think about it. And they just want to live their lives and be friendly neighbors. And they're happy to, to be friends with you and me. And they actually uh, do not like the fundamental ones. The fundamental Muslims think the world's supposed to submit to Allah now. And they are really excited and they want to help make it happen. And the fundamental Muslims are just as happy to kill a moderate Muslim as they are to kill an infidel. And um, so here's an interview with psychologist Nikolai Senels. He says, Muslims instinctively see our lack of reaction as fear. It is an invitation to attack. And so weakness invites aggression. Now, another word that is helpful to give a definition, is innocent. So when some of these terrorist attacks happen, they say, well, those killers do not represent true Islam because Islam says it's wrong to kill the innocent. Well, what's innocent? Innocent is a faithful follower of the way of Allah. And so the fundamental Muslims say that if you are not a faithful follower of the way of Allah, you're not innocent, you're guilty. And it says, Allah love loveth not those who reject the faith, be ruthless to the infidel unbeliever, Make war on the infidel, fight those who believe not in Allah, kill the disbeliever. And so when they say it's wrong to kill the innocent, they're saying it's wrong to kill faithful Muslims. Right. But the fundamental Muslims are just as happy to kill a moderate Muslim as they are to, to kill an infidel because they think the moderate Muslim has departed from the way of Allah. And um, so we got the Sunnis, followers of Abu Bakr, the father-in-law and the Shia followers of Ali, Muhammad's son-in-law. And uh, the uh, Shia have an interesting uh, doctrine, and that's the Mahdi. And they think this Mahdi, the 12th, 12th Imam, the Mahdi, he's going to come back, and he's going to uh, kill all the Christians and kill all the Jews and kill all the apes and kill all the pigs. And they describe their Mahdi, which fits the biblical definition of the Antichrist. Sure. And so they're looking forward to this person uh, arriving. And um, so whereas modern Muslims are happy to live in the West, you have people like this, Ajim Kadori, Islam for UK. And he said, we've had enough of democracy and man-made law. We call for a complete upheaval of the British ruling system and demand full implementation of Sharia in Britain. And so uh, that's what's happening. What's Sharia? It's trying to be like Muhammad. Right. So Muhammad's the perfect Muslim. So we want to be, they want to be like him. So Sharia law, um, what Christians want to be like Jesus, WWJD. Well, fundamental Muslims want to be like Muhammad, the Sunnah, the way. Now there's a little difference. Even though Christians want to be like Jesus, Christians do not believe they go to heaven by being like Jesus. They go to heaven because they believe that Jesus died on the cross to pay for all their sins. And they want to live like Jesus to show the rest of the world how much God loves them. Exactly right. Not so in Islam. They think their chances of going to paradise are directly proportional to how closely they can follow Muhammad's example. But even if they follow it to a T, Muhammad himself said, though I'm the prophet of Allah, I don't know what Allah will do with me. Right. So there's no security in that faith. Uh, unless you die in jihad where you're killing an infidel, they well, um, teach that that will guarantee you paradise. I'm gonna now, the irony is that if there were, hypothetically, if there were a sin that could guarantee you that would go to hell, what would it be? It's like, well, wait a second. Jesus will forgive any sin. But what if you die in the act of committing a premeditated murder? You're murdering somebody and you're dying in the process. You're not alive afterwards to ask for forgiveness. That would be an iffy situation. So what in Christian doctrine could possibly guarantee you're going to hell is what in Islamic teaching they think will guarantee you heaven. Right. So they, they might be 
in for a rude awakening. Instead of guaranteeing paradise, it may be guaranteeing the opposite. But I want to, uh, we'll bring it to a close right here because I know you're out of time and I, I want us to stop right here. But I, I do want you to, uh, you can go ahead and say this and then we're going to pick it up right here. Uh, I'll get with you a couple of weeks. We'll we'll pick it up right here because I want you to finish this out because there's a ton of questions I got to ask you and we'll bring it more into modern times. But this has been good stuff. But I do want to ask you a question if you want to bring us both back on the screen here as we wrap this up. How much of this current uh, move of Islam, is, is there such a thing as, I, I know you've sort of covered this, but I think you brought us something beautifully, and I, I've heard this stated before. The, the idea that there's peaceful Muslims, moderate, this moderate Muslim, fundamental Muslim thing, the way that I heard Gabriel decide, describe this in his book, and I think it was right on, and I'll let you chime in and we wrap it up. He said that there's a lot of Christians that know the Bible, they read the Bible, but they don't follow the Bible. They're not good Christians. They don't act like Christ. They do a lot of things that are just not right. Uh, and they don't follow the Word of God. And he said, Muslims, he said, the only reason America doesn't have a bloodbath is that a majority of Muslims don't follow the Quran. They read the Quran. They claim they're Muslim. But like you said, they don't follow the kill the infidels. But if they did follow their holy book, Bill, we would have a bloodbath in this country and any nation that's controlled by Islam, no Christian would be saved and no Jew would be saved. And I would submit as we close, they're not safe anyway, because this is bubbling at the surface. And eventually, I think that the spirit realm is going to cause things to erupt in this earth, that this war that they're asking for in this Quran is coming to planet Earth. Let you wrap this up. I know you got about three minutes. I know you got to go. What's your final thoughts on that? And we'll we'll pick it up right here next time. Yeah, yeah. Well, a, a lot of them really don't believe it, but they're afraid to say so publicly um, because they don't want to be uh, attacked. And so uh, they like being in the West so that they can not have to live and follow that and not feel threatened. Um, there are some that go to a mosque, and it's a, a peer pressure religion. So they, they, they don't teach for you to study yourself. You have to go through an imam that will explain it to you. And so uh, and if the imam is a moderate imam, then the people underneath of his uh, covering will be moderate. But if the imam gradually moves them into a fundamental, um, they'll feel pressured um, as part of the group and so we've seen that um, where you'll have them come in and they'll live relatively uh, westernized, going to pools and swimming and everything. And then all of a sudden, uh, they're not at the pool anymore. Mm -hmm. And the, the girls aren't walking around their swimming suits anymore. Well, what happened? Well, the, the imam said, don't do that anymore. And boom, they all have to follow it. Um, but it's, uh, it's a battle. One of the things that we have seen is that when the non-Muslim world shows itself strong, the violent aspect of that faith uh, goes into remission. It's interesting. And then when the, the uh, non-Muslim world shows itself weak, that's when it comes out of remission. And so there's an attitude of when your enemy is strong, retreat. When your enemy is weak, attack. And they, they believe in waiting us out a long time. And we're going to get into that more. I want us to, as I say, get more of the modern thing. But listen, I really appreciate you. And I'll get with you uh, this week. And we'll schedule a part two of this. Because I know we didn't really finish this. And I really want to. And I want to thank you for being with me tonight in this pre-recorded interview. And I will be in touch. AmericanMinute.com. I will remember. I always get the .com.org mixed up. AmericanMinute.com is your website. And I encourage folks to go there. A lot of good material. Do you have any new material, new books that you're promoting right now? Real quick. I know you got about a minute. Yeah. Well, Ameri the book called What Every American Needs to Know About the Quran is what we talked about today. What Every good. American Needs to Know About the Quran. And I do have videos on it as well. Well, I encourage people to get that. Bill Fetter, everybody, we appreciate him being with us. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Bill, thank you so much for being with me, and I'll be in touch in a couple of weeks. And we'll, we'll thank you. Thank you, my friend. And that was that tonight. He was. Uh, we're we're always grateful to get him. And uh, when we did that interview uh, a couple of weeks ago, he was on a time. He was actually getting ready to travel. He he stays busy 
all the time. I mean, several weeks out of the year, and uh, when we get him, it's we're fortunate to get him, honestly. And uh, we're grateful for him. That was good stuff, and we hadn't finished it. We're going to talk about the modern version of Islam a little bit more and its goals for the future on this next interview. And I encourage you to visit his website and order his books and these videos. And uh, very encouraging, very informative. Um, I, I was, I'm a history person. I, I wish Bill Federer would have been my history teacher in high school. I would have just taken his class and nothing else. I'd have failed everything else. And I said, I just want to, I want to go to Mr. Federer's class every day. Um, but you can actually, um, I've got a, a, a little booklet up here, America, uh, God and Country. And we used to give those out, um, at times when we are getting ready to order some more of those because we're going to do that this year to um, help folks and uh, we're going to probably be calling on Bill quite a bit this year with the election year here and some things and uh, just have to find a time to get him on. I wish we had him on a night schedule. It's hard to get him at night because I'd love for him to sit with us and take questions but it's every time I do it I have to interview him in the uh, afternoon so it's hard to do that live but we'll, we'll work on that. We'll work on that. But I hope you enjoyed this tonight. And uh, we got a, actually a good audience in the house tonight. I just want to say this. I, I, I have been very derelict in, in acknowledging our um, Twitter folks on X tonight. We've had a very, very good, um, very, very good audience over there lately. And uh, we want to welcome all you folks to our Twitter account at the Mac Files 45. And uh, also, we've got a Telegram room uh, that you can go in and find a lot of stores. Now, I know that uh, I know every one of you are just so disappointed that you had to listen to Bill Federer and you didn't get to sit and just rah, 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 rah the State of the Union address with Joe Biden tonight. So we're sorry we took you away from that. But um, no, I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> there are there are good things for the Mac Files, and on a Thursday night on the seventh day of March, twenty twenty four, we if we didn't do anything else tonight, we kept you from tying a rope around your neck and hanging yourself from your kitchen door, having to listen to Joe Biden tell you how great the country is tonight, and how evil Trump is, and how that this border is not open. And there is some bad Republicans that have caused this. And I hadn't even listened to it, but I can almost give you the talking points. Uh, uh, they probably doped him up. I saw a meme somebody said or something. They said he's on the good stuff tonight. They probably had to give him some good stuff. I was reading a report tonight. The Democrats were very nervous about this because they're scared to death he's going to get out there and say something stupid tonight. And uh, I wouldn't even worry about that. I'd be word that he would just stop talking and just go quiet and not know where he's at. And folks, I'm not making fun of that. Look, I, I've said this before in this network, and I mean it tonight. It's it's not a laughing matter. It's not a laughing matter. I'm very concerned about the future of this country. And I will tell you this. This thing that Bill Federer talked about tonight, our greatest enemy um, is going to come from this Islamic realm of the world. And I don't know if you caught it, um, it perked my ears the, when I heard it during the interview, and it perked my ears again tonight. But that article in 2016, where it says, Islam recognizes weakness, and they wait you out until you're weak to attack. When you're strong, they'll wait. And then when you get weak, they attack. And uh, if you think about it, you just think about it. We had 9-11 on 2001. That's almost 23 years ago. There's been a couple of attacks in the world since then. The Bali nightclub incident in 02. We had Jordan get attacked in 05. I remember that under Bush Jr. There's been other uh, Islam, uh, Islamic attacks. Iran has become really the face of Islam in these modern times. Iraq has sort of quietened down, but don't do not take that as a sign that they're they're always going to be quiet. Iraq. And this Middle East is going to play a huge role in the things that are coming on this earth. And this Islamic influence is going to 
play a huge role in Bible prophecy. There's a lot of teachers, and one in particular I'm thinking about. He believes that the Antichrist himself will be Islamic, and I don't reject that theory outright. I don't know. I don't think anybody really knows who he is going to be, but I tell you what, um, a lot of the things that he does and will do against Israel uh, would line up with the hatred of Islam toward the Jews. Uh, I need to remind you, for those that may not understand this part, I think most do in this audience, but there may be a few that are newcomers and come across the network and they're just sitting here, who is this guy? Uh, the attack on October the 7th was an Islamic attack. It was an Islamic attack on Israel. Hamas is an Islamic entity. Hezbollah is an Islamic entity. Islam is what drives those terrorist groups. It drives the Middle East. It drives Iran. It drives Iraq. It drives Saudi Arabia. It drives Yemen. It drives Carter, Qatar, I mean. Uh, it, it, it drives uh, Turkey. Uh, it has invaded Europe, and it is invading this country. And I never thought I would dream the day when, or see the day that a dream that I would see today, I got that backwards, that we would have people in our government that literally refuse to put their hand on the Bible to take an oath to protect this country because they're Muslim. The way I look at it, I don't give two bit pins about your religion, but if you can't take an oath to protect this country, you don't need to be serving in this government. But we elect them. We have got entire Muslim communities tonight uh, in this country. Dearborn, Michigan comes to mind. And uh, they have threatened to boycott the 2024 election with Biden. They're not going to vote for him and uh, because of his support for Israel. And uh, I think when we get built on next time, I'm going to really, we're going to hone in on that part of this um, and talk about Islam's threat. Um, I saw Sheila Daspit out there. I want to remind everybody, the 22nd and 23rd, we're just a few weeks away from this, we're going to be in Waveland, Mississippi. It's, it's simple to find on the Gulf Coast. It's about 45, 50 minutes west of Biloxi. Uh, the Church on the Pines Lutheran Church, great little group, and it's where <clears throat> Sheila's Beautiful Gate Christian Academy meets there in Waveland. We're going to be talking about this very thing uh, Saturday. Uh, I think probably during the uh, morning session at 10, and we may save it for uh, Saturday night, I don't know, but we're going to talk about Islam's threat to Israel and the West and tie in how some of the aspects of the Antichrist uh, are Islamic in many ways. And again, we don't know for sure what his uh, background will be, but it would not shock me if it was. Um, he very well could be. But all of these things that have went against Israel, folks, all these nations that have come against her and all these nations that hate America tonight, they hate us, they hate Israel, and they hate Christians. And that's just it. And, I, and if you call it another thing that Bill said in that interview, the fundamental Muslims, they even hate their own. They hate the moderates that don't join in the fight. They don't join in the fight. And they're willing to kill the moderates. They don't care. They want Allah to come now. And uh, it's intriguing stuff. And I would encourage you to share it out tonight and listen again and take notes. I know many of you were taking notes. And so it's... Uh, very, very powerful uh, show tonight, and I hope you caught it, and I know most of you did. I really do. I appreciate you for being here tonight. Um, I will tell you this about the Koran that's very sad. Um, you can, I've not read the Koran. I don't really plan to. I've read passages of it. I've, I've studied it in a way to when I've dealt with Bible prophecy because there's a lot of horrendous things that it says. <clears throat> and I, I I'll save that for last, what I'm about to say. But I want to say this about the Koran. Um, from cover to cover, there's not one mention, not one, that God is love. They don't mention the word love. You cannot find the word love in the Koran. It's all about hate. It's all about destruction. It is all about death. It is all about calls for the destruction of Israel, a call for the destruction of the infidels a call for the world to submit itself to the will of Islam, the will of Allah. But there's not one mention, not one mention in that book of love. Not one. Um, that is a 
stark contrast to the Christian's book called the Bible. When everything in God's Word speaks of God being love, God is love. God just doesn't have love, but God is love. And they that know God love. You know, Bill made a comment tonight about the definition of peace is not the same for everybody. The definition of liberty is not the same for everybody. And sadly tonight, in this hate-filled, toxic world of this God-forsaken earth that is soaked in self-righteousness and religious hatred, not everybody has the right definition of love either. And I'd be very careful when people say that they're doing it out of love or they love you or they, they do this and that. Not everybody understands that definition. And I can tell you right now, the Muslims have no clue of that definition at all, whatsoever. And it's what drives their theology. And sad to say, with many Christians, is what drives theirs because there's no love in their religion. There's no love in their theology. But I will say this to you tonight, folks. If you're a child of God and you're a true Christian and love is not your theology, you're not a Christian. You're religious and you have some form of godliness, but you don't understand the power of God and you don't understand Him and you sure don't understand Christ. And I want to make it clear as I close tonight, we don't hate, as, as Christians, we don't hate the Muslims. We don't. They hate us. They do. They hate Christians. They hate the Jews. They hate America. But the true child of God prays for the Muslims. I pray for these Muslims tonight. I pray for those that are blinded by this religion of Islam. I pray for those that are blinded by the religion of Christianity because the religion part of Christianity blinds people to true faith. We've turned Christianity into nothing more than a religion, folks, and it's not. It's a relationship with Christ, and those that have a relationship with Christ understand that God is love. God is love, and we don't hate as Christians, and we don't do things as Christians that other religions do because we're not a religion we are followers and we are lovers of Jesus and because we are lovers of him and we understand him and we want to know him and we do know him intimately, we don't treat our fellow man. We don't treat our fellow man in the ways that many Christians do. You know, I was listening to somebody today and talking to them and it is a sad state of affairs that we have driven people away from the church. And I'm thinking of Michael Jackson, the late Michael Jackson, and um, there was all sorts of rumors about him at the end and some of the things that he was involved in. But one of the things that I remember st struck me, um, he had a crossroads in his life and he wanted to find religion. I didn't say he wanted to find Christ, he wanted to find religion. And I don't know how true this story is, but Dr. James Dobson went to see him. You had the Dobson to focus on the family and tried to witness to Michael Jackson. He did. But at the end of the day, Michael Jackson chose Islam over Christianity. Now, this part of the story, I don't know if it's true, but there was some rumor that the reason that he chose Islam over Christianity was their acceptance of him and their non-judgmental ways toward others, even though he was blinded by the fact that Islam was not just judgmental, they wanted to kill everybody. And he was seduced by the peaceful face, the peaceful face of Islam. And he rejected that of Christianity. We walk to a different beat as children of God. We are a different type of people. We don't walk around this world hating people. We don't walk around this world chewing and destroying lives and destroying people's nations and terrorizing people and with the sword. That's what Islam is. It's, it's the sword of Islam. It's, there's a term in Islam, the sword of Islam. We, and, it, and it cuts. It cuts. It causes people to bow down to the sword of Islam. We as Christians, we don't operate in that spirit. True Christians don't. We don't operate in that spirit. The Muslims don't know any other way. 
because it is what's taught to them as children. They're raised in this hate. They're raised to hate Christians. They're raised to hate Jews. They're raised to hate America. They're raised to hate any religion out there that does not bow down to this sword. And I firmly believe, folks, that our greatest threat to this nation tonight is still the same as it was on 9-11 in 2001, the same spirit that drove those planes into those towers 23 years ago, coming up this September, is still alive and well. It may be at an ebb right now. We may not be seeing it openly, destroying buildings and blowing up things. We saw a, a, a Islamic attack on October the 7th when Hamas attacked Israel. We did. We witnessed it. The world don't see it that way. The world sees that Israel was the aggressor and is, that this little bunch of freedom fighters was trying to free Palestine from the Israeli aggression, which is a complete lie of the devil. And that same devil that promotes that lie has put a blindness over the Islamic people, the Muslims, just like there's a blindness over the Jewish people as it relates to Christ. But I can tell you all this, it's all taken away by faith in Christ. Once somebody comes to Christ, that veil is removed, and he can remove that veil, and he can remove that hatred. He can remove all of that in one's heart. And some of the most powerful testimonies I've ever heard and ever witnessed and read about are Muslims that have come to Christ. And to read how that their heart was once full of hatred and when they came to Christ, it was now filled with nothing but love for all men. It makes us pause as Christians to understand what wonderful salvation we have that our God that we worship is not a God of hate. He's not a God of vengeance. No, he's a God of love. And it doesn't mean that God does not judge sin. It does not mean that God does not address things. He does. It's not some just case sera, sera, kumbaya, everything is okay. No, that's not what I'm talking about tonight. But even in God's judgment, he remembers mercy. Even in God's judgment, he moves in mercy every time he humanly, and let me change that, every time he divinely can, because God's not human. <laughs> God's ways are not our ways. He is a spirit, and he is not a man that he should lie or repent. But I can tell you tonight, God is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He is not the God of Ishmael, Esau, and Allah. Even though the Muslims don't realize it, he is their God, and he's the only true God. They say there's only, there's only one God. Allah is the one true God. No, Allah is not the one true God. And I can say that to you if you're listening to me tonight as a Muslim in love and tell you that in love, I'm not saying that because I hate you. I'm saying that because I love you. And I'm saying that to you because I care for your soul. There's only one true God. And his name is Jehovah. And his son is Jesus Christ. And he came to die for you just like he came to die for me. And if you'll believe in him tonight, on this Thursday night, all of that hatred and all of that anger and that remorse and all of that vengeance that you seek to destroy those that do not bow down to Allah and your religion, it can be taken away. It can be taken away. We just want you to know, as a Christian believer tonight, that we love you. As Muslims, we don't hate you. Most of your religion hates us. But you don't realize this, and this is the weird thing, and I'm going to close on this. The Jews hate Christ. Many Jews that reject Christ, I, you know, it's a strong word, but they reject Christ and they absolutely abhor his name. They don't want you to talk about Christ to them, but the world hates Israel because of Christ. And many Muslims don't realize it that their hatred for America and the Jews and Christians is not really hatred for Jews, Americans, and Christians. Their hatred is toward Christ too. And Satan has taken that hatred and caused a blindness to come on them as well to believe that their religion is the only way to God. And that's the sinister nature of the, of the devil and the sinister nature of the enemy and the power that he wells over this earth tonight. But I will tell you this, neighbor, it's getting late. 
And this world is a dangerous place. And we as believers in Jesus need to be very vigilant with our families tonight, and we need to be aware of this threat. And we as American citizens need to be aware. And look, I, I don't say this lightly about President Biden. He does not recognize this threat. This, this administration don't recognize it, but there's been very few administrations in this history of America since 9-11 that has. I think President Trump recognized it to a degree, but um, we had better start recognizing it or there won't be an America because the threat no longer is coming at us outwardly. It's coming from us within. It is coming at us from within because we've got people in our government that is subverting our government from within tonight to bring America into an Islamic caliphate and to destroy her from within tonight and eradicate faith off this planet and eradicate faith off this landscape of America. We had better come to grips with that. We better come to grips with that. Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming. All right. It's 1028. Did you enjoy Bill Federer? Put some fire in that house for me. No show tomorrow night. I uh, won't see you Saturday. I will see you Sunday morning. Sunday morning Bible study. We encourage you to be with us. And uh, we're going to be picking up overcoming spiritual warfare. Good stuff again Sunday morning. Come on back be with us. We may even have a Sunday night Bible study. Two Bible studies for you Sunday. So we'll see. We'll see about that. And then uh, Monday night, the 11th, we have got Miss Ricky Wilson back with us. And Tuesday night, we got the one and only Magdalene Rose is back with us. We're going to have another election night Tuesday. The big night is the 19th. Leslie Millway may be with us next week. And we got some other folks sort of in the works. And um, we just hope that you've enjoyed this week of shows on the Mac Files. Because we've enjoyed being with you. Now, we will be here in the morning. One one final show tomorrow. So we're on our faith network. So you got to come over to our faith. We've been studying Daniel and the Bible studies. I see some of my students out there tonight. Get some good rest. The host will get some good rest, so he'll get up on time and be with you. Like he was a little late to class this morning. <laughs> just, just a little bit. But we're going to be here on time in the morning, and we're going to talk about some good stuff tomorrow, and it's going next week. These next few weeks is going to be pretty deep on our morning Bible studies about Daniel. So come on, be with us. We're in Daniel eight right now. We're going to talk about some of this stuff in the morning because we're we're talking about. The principality behind the Antichrist. And you don't want to miss this tomorrow on our morning Bible studies. God bless you. God bless your families. God bless this great nation of America. March 22nd, 23rd, Waveland, Mississippi in April 19th through 20. We come into the Midwest. We come into Sioux Falls, South Dakota. Hell or high water. And we're going to have a prophecy conference up in the heart of the heartland bread country. The bread basket of the country. South Dakota. You South Dakotians and you Nebraska folks, Iowa and North Dakota and I guess what else is South Dakota near? Uh, Wisconsin area, Michigan up in that area. You might be able to get down there in a few hours. So come on, be with us. And we're going to be in other locations later this year. And um, we hope that you'll join us when you can and if you can. But we're going to have some good stuff ahead this year. And we got an election year, folks. Time to... Katie barred the door, tightened the ship, put your seatbelt on, get your popcorn ready, and keep it right here on the Mike Wallace News Network. We're grateful you're with us tonight. If you enjoyed Bill Federer, put some fire in that house for me. See you in the morning on the Bible study. See you back here on the News Network Monday night with Ricky Wilson, and I will see you all on the Faith Network tomorrow and Sunday morning, maybe Sunday night. And until then, Chris McDonald, far. Mr. Bill Federer, on the 7th day of March, 2024. May the Lord bless you tonight. Be blessed out there. We love you. If you enjoyed the show again, give us a little fire. I'm going to go out. Uh, let me see what I'm going to do tonight. I, I'm going to play a better song going out than Gentle on My Mind. I'm not going to play that one again. I'm going to play one of my songs off of our brand new CD, Happy Rhythm. Happy Rhythm in My Soul. And uh, we've been playing this in the morning Bible studies. And I'll just I just sort of feel like playing it again tonight because, you know, Jubilee's coming. And it's coming in the by and by. Let this song bless you going out tonight. See you in the morning on Faith Network. Tell me tonight. Jubilee's are coming. Jubilee's are coming. Coming in the by and by. Gonna go fly. Gonna go fly. Flying up to the sky. 
When I sing with Jesus, when I sing with Jesus, coming down after me. Gonna go to meet him, gonna go to meet him, what a glad jubilee. Well, jubilees are coming, it's coming in the morning, what a happy time it's gonna be. Gonna be. Better be a praying, better get yourself ready if you want to see the jubilee. Everybody's gonna be shouting and singing, everybody's gonna be free. Everybody's gonna be happy at the Jubilee. Gonna be shouting and singing at the Jubilee. Gonna wear a crown, gonna wear it in the morning, wear it in glory land. Glory land. Gonna play a harp, gonna play it in the morning, everything's gonna be so grand. Voices by the millions will be singing, gonna join them, join the happy song of victory. Gonna be shouting and singing at the Jubilee. Some of these mornings, some of these mornings, gonna put on my crown. Into that city, into that city, just gonna walk around. Gonna be a shouting, gonna be a shouting, gonna shout victory. In that city, in that city, gonna be a jubilee. Well, the jubilee's coming, it's coming in the morning. What a happy time it's gonna be. Gonna be. Better be a praying, better get yourself a ready if you want to see the Jubilee. Everybody's going to be shouting and singing, everybody's going to be free. Everybody's going to be happy at the Jubilee. Everybody's going to be happy at the Jubilee. Going to wear a crown, going to wear it in the morning, wear it in glory land. Going to play a harp, going to play it in the morning, everything's going to be so grand. Voices by the millions will be singing when I join them. Join the happy song of victory. Gonna be shouting and singing at the Jubilee. Gonna be shouting and singing at the Jubilee. I am filled, I am filled to overflowing. To overflowing. I've, got joy I've got joy down deep within. Down deep within. And this joy of the Lord is my strength in the storm. I've got overwhelming joy. I've got overwhelming joy, I confess. It makes me outrun the devil when he's following me. Makes me turn to his face and say it's time to flee. It puts the wind just beneath me, sets my wings on the rise. It's his overwhelming joy in my life. And I am filled to overflowing. I've got joy down deep within. And this joy of the Lord is my strength in the storm. I've got overwhelming joy and I'm feeling so blessed. I've got overwhelming joy, I confess. Even when I'm discouraged from the worries and strife, and I reach deep inside to turn up a smile, then I detect deep excitement in the depths of my soul. Then this overwhelming joy starts to flow. I am filled, I am filled to, overflowing. to overflowing. I've got joy, I've got joy down, deep within. down deep within. And this joy of the Lord is my strength in the storm. I've got overwhelming joy and I'm feeling so blessed. I've got overwhelming joy, I confess. I am filled, I am filled to overflowing. To overflowing. I've got joy, I've got joy down, deep within. down deep within, and this joy of the Lord is my strength in the storm. I've got overwhelming joy, and I'm feeling so blessed. I've got overwhelming joy, I confess. I've got overwhelming joy, I confess. In times like these, we need the Savior. In times like these, we need an anchor. Be very sure. Be very sure. Your anchor holds 
and grips the solid rock. In times like these, we need the Bible. In times like these, we need revival. Be very sure. Be very sure. Your anchor holds and grips the solid. the solid rock.